my name is Livingston Irongo. We are, I'm going to discuss biology form two, and the topic is the major topic is transport in animals, and the subtopic is the functions of red blood cells. The first and major function of red blood cells is transport of oxygen. So, what happens is the red blood cells transport oxygen from the lungs to other tissues. We are talking of other tissues because the blood itself is a tissue and therefore the oxygen will not be transported to the tissue that is transporting it. So we talk of other tissues and those other tissues are at a low or lower oxygen concentration. So what happens is that as the blood passes through the lungs, hemoglobin in the red blood cells combine with oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin is a compound that is unstable, so it can easily split or dissociate. So when the blood reaches the, the region, uh, reaches in the region of uh, low oxygen concentration, for example, in the muscle cells, oxyhemoglobin will dissociate or we say it splits to release oxygen to the tissues and the hemoglobin is free to be taken back to the lungs to pick more oxygen. So this can be summarized in the form of an equation where we have hemoglobin plus oxygen that happens in the lungs to form oxyhemoglobin. Then in the tissues, oxyhemoglobin breaks down or dissociates to release oxygen to the tissues and hemoglobin. So that's what happens in transport of oxygen. Now, we have got other areas where we have got low oxygen concentration. For example, is in high altitude areas. For example, we have Nyahururu and Eldoret. If a person moves from a low altitude area where the concentration of oxygen is high, and they move to high altitude area where the concentration of oxygen is low, their body responds by producing more red blood cells and this will increase the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. This process is known as acclimatization. And this is what athletes, that is those people who take part in athletics take advantage of. They move from where they live, which could be low altitude areas, to high altitude areas like Inyahururu and Eldolet. When they go there to train, their body becomes acclimatized and they produce a lot of red blood cells, which will mean that during the actual time of training, they will have an advantage over the other abilities because they will have a lot of red blood cells, meaning that they'll be taking to their tissues a lot of a lot of oxygen which is required for the very rapid respiration required during the competition. Now, there is another type of hemoglobin known as phytohemoglobin. Phytohemoglobin is found in fetus. Fetus are developing inside the mother's uterus. So, the phytohemoglobin has a higher affinity, has a higher affinity to oxygen. That is, it will combine more readily with oxygen than the adult hemoglobin that we mentioned here. And that means that even if the mother supplies less or low oxygen concentration, the fetus will pick enough oxygen and this will ensure that the processes that take place in his or her body will be okay nothing will be impaired. So, but after birth, the fetal red blood cells that now contain what we call the fetal hemoglobin will break down. As they break down, they release the pigments that are found in the hemoglobin. So after they release those pigments, the skin of this newborn may appear slightly yellow. And this condition is known as jodis. But it clears within two to three weeks. So that's what happens to the fetus. <clears throat> now, there is another, we have said that 
the red blood cells will transport oxygen to the tissues. The muscles cells themselves have got another pigment, and that pigment is known as myoglobin. So myoglobin is found in muscle cells, so found in muscle cells, and it has higher affinity. It has even higher affinity to oxygen than hemoglobin. So what this means is that as the blood passes through the muscles, myoglobin will pick up a lot of oxygen, which will be required by the muscle cells for the process of contraction and relaxation of the muscle cells. Then <clears throat> we have something else that we need to mention, which is very important when we come to oxygen. Remember, the body needs oxygen. So there are some instances where the body may not receive enough oxygen. And a very good example is when <clears throat> there is a jiko. Jiko, a burning jiko. Burning jiko, or what we call the charcoal stove. And the exhaust fumes from vehicles and this will be in poorly ventilated rooms in poorly ventilated rooms so when they are burning in poorly ventilated rooms what will happen is that the gas that they produce is carbon to oxide. Carbon to oxide. Carbon to oxide is a gas that is dangerous. And the reason is because hemoglobin has a higher affinity to carbon to oxide than oxygen. So what will happen is that uh, carbon to oxide will now combine with hemoglobin to form uh, a compound that is known as carboxy hemoglobin to form carboxy hemoglobin the dangerous nature of this is because it is more stable so it will not dissociate easily that means that when carboxy hemoglobin is taken to the tissues, it will not dissociate easily. So hemoglobin will not be released. So it will go back to the lungs as carboxy hemoglobin. This reduces the oxygen carrying capacity of blood, uh, which may lead to suffocation and eventually death. <coughs> so <coughs> you can say this. Carbon 2 oxide has a higher affinity than a hemoglobin. Uh, carbon 2 oxide has a higher affinity. It, it's okay. It is. Hemoglobin. Let's talk of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin has a higher affinity to carbon two oxide to carbon two oxide than oxygen. And that is what makes it dangerous. So what will happen is that uh, <clears throat> it is carbon two oxide that will combine with the oxygen, combine with the hemoglobin before any oxygen that is available may combine with hemoglobin. So on reaching tissues, e.g. muscle cells, carboxy hemoglobin 
does not dissociate does not dissociate so this reduces oxygen carrying capacity oxygen carrying capacity of hemoglobin which we have said can lead to suffocation and sometimes death if the person is not removed and taken to an area where there is uh, enough oxygen and we have said we are reducing oxygen carrying capacity because carboxyhemoglobin is more stable than oxyhemoglobin that means that it is not going carboxyhemoglobin will not be broken down so we are going to reduce the hemoglobin that is available to supply oxygen to the tissues so we look at the other function of uh, red blood cells and this is uh, transport of carbon for oxide carbon for oxide remember there we are talking of carbon to oxide so carbon to oxide combines with the hemoglobin to form carboxy hemoglobin we are going to see that compound that is formed when carbon four oxide combines with uh, combines with hemoglobin so we can write an equation here carbon to oxide plus oxygen we form carboxy hemoglobin which we have said is more stable so the function number two of red blood cells is transport of carbon for oxide carbon for oxide so the, the red blood cells are involved in transport of carbon for oxide in two major ways so a the red blood cells inside the red blood cells there is an enzyme known as carbonic anhydrase carbonic anhydrase and this carbonic anhydrase what it does it increases the rate at which carbon four oxide dissolves in the water in uh, the plasma to form an to form an acid known as carbonic acid so and the carbonic acid thereafter dissociates so this is uh, what happens the main one is that most of uh, carbon four oxide most of carbon four oxide that is produced in the tissues will uh, produced in tissues will enter the red blood cells enter red blood cells after entering them inside there is an enzyme so the enzyme carbonic anhydrase this is h carbonic anhydrase speeds up speeds up <coughs> the dissolving dissolving and dissociation of the acid form and the acid is carbonic acid so it dis speeds up dissolving of carbon four oxide and dissociation of the acid formed so here the acid formed is carbonic acid so carbonic acid is formed 
after carbonic acid is formed after uh, carbon four oxide dissolves in water. So it will make this dissolving proceed at a very high rate. Then later, after that, it then dissociates. And it, it dissociates into hydrogen ions and hydrogen carbonate ions. And hydrogen carbonate ions. So we can uh, represent that in an equation here. So carbon for oxide dissolves in water to form a carbonic acid. This is uh, characterized by anhydrase enzyme known as carbonic carbonic and hydrase carbonic and hydrase so we form H2CO3 so and uh, what will happen later is that let's write the word equation in biology we insist on word equations carbonic anhydrase we form carbonic acid carbonic acid is a weak acid then later the carbonic acid dissociates to form hydrogen ions and hydrogen carbonate ions so this is the carbonic acid Carbonic acid, these are hydrogen ions and hydrogen carbonate ions. After this, <clears throat> what happens, remember this is inside the red blood cells. After the hydrogen carbonate ions are formed, they move out of the red blood cells. So hydrogen carbonate ions, now we know that it is written as HCO3. I can write it correctly like that. Hydrogen carbonate ions leave the red blood cells, leave the red blood cells and enter the blood plasma from where it is taken to the lungs. So to be taken to the lungs. On reaching the lungs, on reaching the lungs, the hydrogen carbonate ions form back the form back the carbon-4 oxide, which is eliminated in exhaled air. So we can say, in the lungs, hydrogen carbonate ions are converted to carbon-4 oxide, to carbon-4 oxide or they form back the carbon-4 oxide which is eliminated which is eliminated in exhaled air as you breathe out so that is uh, what happens of course the hydrogen ions will be used in other body functions like maintaining the correct pH of the body fluids. Then there is another way through which uh, carbon dioxide is transported. 
So, <coughs> the other way is hemoglobin, hemoglobin in the red blood cells combines with some carbon-4 oxide with some carbon-4 oxide to form a compound known as carbaminum hemoglobin. A compound known as carbaminum hemoglobin. And carbaminum hemoglobin will now be taken to the lungs where it is going to dissociate to release carbon-4 oxide and the hemoglobin, which will now be free to pick more oxygen. So in the lungs, carbamino hemoglobin, carbamino hemoglobin uh, dissociates to release carbon-4 oxide which is removed in exhaled air just like above there and free a hemoglobin is and free hemoglobin which has come from the carbamino hemoglobin will pick more oxygen from the lungs. We'll pick more oxygen from the lungs. So to help us remember this information, we can again write this in form of an equation. So we have carbon-4 oxide combining with the hemoglobin. And what we form? is that compound known as carbamino hemoglobin carbamino hemoglobin then because we know that sometimes in our system a question has come on how is carbon 4 oxide transported in the body so although the other function, uh, the other way through which carbon-4 oxide is transported is not through red blood cells. It is appropriate to mention it at this point that some, about, almost about 7% of carbon-4 oxide, so some of carbon-4 oxide is dissolved in plasma that is in water in the plasma and is transported in solution form is transported in solution form to the lungs from where it will be removed from the body through the exhaled Air. So there are three main ways in which carbon dioxide is uh, transported in the body. One, by the red blood cells through the action of carbonic anhydrase enzyme. The other one is through combining with hemoglobin to form carbamino hemoglobin. And finally, through dissolving in plasma. And uh, it will be transported in solution form. Remember, not much can be transported in that manner because the carbon-4 oxide has got very low solubility in water. So we are going to look at the other cellular component and the other cellular component of uh, the blood tissue are the white blood cells. They are the white blood cells. So that will be number two. Number one was the red blood cells. So number two, white blood cells, also known as leukocytes. 
So white blood cells known as leukocytes. What is the nature of these cells? One, they are colorless. Although the term we use is white, they are not white in color. They are only given the name white to distinguish them from the red blood cells which are red in color due to the presence of the pigment known as hemoglobin. And the other characteristic is of them is that they are larger than red blood cells. So their size will be larger. The other thing is that they also, their number is that they are fewer. So they will be less in number. They are fewer than red blood cells. But the number will increase. Number increases during infection. During infection, so that they can clear the disease causing microorganisms, which could be bacteria, viruses, or microscopic fungi. So, <clears throat> however, there are some instances in patients with HIV, the number will decrease. So the number decreases during infection of HIV. That is human immunodeficiency virus. The number decreases and also during the uh, <coughs> infection of uh, coronavirus, the number will also decrease because those virus will destroy a lot of white blood cells. So where are they formed? Oh, okay. Before we see where they are formed, do they have nuclei or not? Yes, they have nuclei. So we say that they are nucleated. They are nucleated, meaning that they have nuclei and the nuclei will have very many or varied shapes. We are going to see those shapes of the nuclei, varied shapes of nuclei. We are going to see those uh, uh, nuclei uh, shortly. So where are they formed? Most of them are formed in bone marrow of long bones. So the bone marrow of long bones. A good example of the bones that are long is the femur. Femur is the bone that is found in the thigh region. It's known as femur. Then we have another one known as tibia. Tibia is that bone from the knee to the ankle. That is on the front side. It is known as tibia. Of course, there is the other thinner one, but also long, known as fibula. But I'll just give the two examples there. And they are also formed in another region, what we call the lymph nodes. So they are also formed in the lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are immunological glands that are found, some of them in the neck region, in the groin region, when you have a wood, you may have noticed that there is a part of your body in the groin region that swells. Those are the lymph nodes because they are responding by producing a lot of, uh, a lot of white blood cells to clear the infection. So what is their function? They protect the body against protect the body against disease causing microorganisms. Against disease causing microorganisms, e.g. we can have bacteria, viruses, uh, microscopic, microscopic fungi, Remember, we have uh, the large fungi like the mushrooms, which do not cause any disease, and the microscopic fungi like yeast, which may cause uh, infections, and sometimes the protozoa. Protozoa like plasmodium. 
So we have got several types of red or white blood cells. So which are these types? So types of red blood of white blood cells are types of white blood cells. <coughs> so there are two main types which are granulocytes. Granulocytes meaning that in the cytoplasm, they appear to have granules. Granules are very tiny grains, and there are those others that do not have the grains. So they are known as agranulocytes. Agranulocytes. So I will give other names of these uh, cells later, but here we just need to know briefly the types that we have. So, uh, examples of granulocytes are mainly three. So, we have the neutrophils. Neutrophils. We have eosinophils. And we have the basophils. Basophils. So, these ones are named depending on the dye that they take up. So we have uh, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils as granulocytes. Then, our granulocytes, we have got two main, uh, two main types. We have the monocytes, and we have the lymphocytes. The lymphocytes. So lymphocytes are formed as you can see in the lymph nodes, that's the name, lymph, lymphocytes in the lymph nodes. All the others are formed in the bone marrow of uh, long bones. So we will start with granulocytes during the next session, which will be coming uh, shortly. Thank you for the lesson. So the next item that we will discuss during the next session are these cells in details, the granulocytes and agranulocytes. Under granulocytes, we will have these three. Under agranulocytes, we will have these two, monocytes and lymphocytes. So we will discuss their shape, their mode of action in clearing the disease-causing micro organisms. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the lesson.